Thank you for taking a little bit of your lunch hour to spend a, spend with us. Uh, I have to say that I am very pleasantly, pleasantly surprised by the overwhelming um, amount of interest in this topic. And not only the diversity of the number of people on a geographical scale, but also from various different industries too. Like we have um, staff from municipalities from across, on, across Canada, actually. We have a number of municipalities here. Um, we also have conservation authorities from across Ontario. Um, insurance companies are here. Real estate agents are here. Environment Canada is here. Uh, there's even some Americans here. So shout out to some of the staff from uh, Michigan that I saw register for this, as well as um, some members of the academic community. So welcome all. Um, and so whether we're talking about shorelands of our Great Lakes or one of the millions of inland lakes and rivers across Canada, the maintenance of shorelands in its natural state is some is of social, economic, and environmental importance. And so this presentation will be discussing one of our newly created resources. And so following today's presentation, you will be sent a copy of this document. Um, as well as uh, the summary document once, once that gets finalized as well. So during today's presentation, please keep your cameras and microphones off for the presentation. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat and then um, I'll be reading them out to Chris uh, when we have the time in about 30 minutes or so. So um, this session will also be recorded. So we'll send you a copy of this following today's um, presentation. But without further ado, we don't have a lot of time, so I want to jump in. Um, we have to speak on this topic our very own Chris Dennison, who was born and raised in the Thousand Islands and has years of personal and professional experience with freshwater stewardship. He holds degrees in political science and biology and currently serves as the environmental protection intern at Watersheds Canada. So without further ado, Chris, you want to take it away? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Darlene, and good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of Watersheds Canada, thank you for attending what I hope will be an insightful webinar on the science behind vegetated shoreland buffers. Today, I will be discussing the scientifically proven benefits of maintaining or restoring vegetated shoreland buffers, including the protection of water quality, the mitigation of erosion, the creation of wildlife habitat, and increasing resilience to the impacts of climate change. Now on the shores of Canada's freshwater lakes, rivers, and streams, we have witnessed a fundamental change in land use patterns. In place of modest and seasonal cottages, there are now often luxurious, fully serviced year-round homes. These intensified building practices often place large dwellings close to the water's edge, strip the land of vegetation to make way for manicured lawns, and often come with large docks and other shoreline structures. When these types of developments are facilitated on a large scale, there are serious environmental consequences, which we will discuss during this webinar. In Watersheds Canada's 2021 Future of Our Shores report, nearly 200 municipal councillors, planners, and freshwater association members from across Ontario were surveyed. These stakeholders reported that shoreland stewardship in official plans and zoning bylaws were generally inadequate to address development pressures. We were also told that although policy was adequately understood by local decision makers, the science of buffers were much less understood, which is why we have developed the science behind vegetated shoreland buffers, a document to address a significant knowledge gap for freshwater residents and decision makers, being the science that supports the maintenance or restoration of native shoreland vegetation. In this webinar, we'll provide a synopsis of this new resource, highlighting the diversity of ecosystem services vegetated shoreland buffers provide. But before we move into a thorough discussion of vegetated buffers and their numerous benefits, it is important that we explain some terminology. You may have noticed that we use the term shoreland buffer rather than shoreline buffer. The reason for this decision reflects an ecosystem-based management approach. Using this approach, we actively recognize a shore ecosystem in its entirety, 
with consideration given to the unique biological functions and needs of the four major ecozones that comprise it. Firstly, a healthy upland zone encompasses the elevated, well-drained area where a forest-like community of native trees and shrubs provide habitat for wildlife. The plants, leaf litter, and other organic material in this zone helps curb runoff that carries pollutants. Next is the riparian zone, the transitional zone composed of a highly diverse community of moisture-tolerant plants where up to 70% of terrestrial wildlife reside at least once during their life cycle. Like the upland zone, the dense community of native plants that make up a healthy riparian zone intercept pollutant carrying runoff and is often the most important line of defense for fresh water. Moving down to the shoreline, the shoreline is the physical edge where land meets the water and where organic debris and root systems create habitat while also mitigating erosion from wind, rain, boat wakes, and ice. Finally, there's the littoral zone, the area of aquatic habitat that extends from the shoreline to the area in the water where light no longer penetrates to the bottom. The aquatic plants that make up a healthy littoral zone provide critical habitat for freshwater species and are significant in the cycling of nutrients and other pollutants. When we consider these four zones together, we can appreciate how each of them, when maintained with healthy communities of native vegetation, provides synergistic protection for freshwater and wildlife. What some might consider a shoreline property is truly a multifaceted shoreland system whose proper function relies on several ecologically unique parts. Now, one of the most important functions of a vegetated shoreland buffer is its promotion of water quality through the interception of pollutants carried by land-based runoff. Many pollutants originate from man-made sources on land and are carried into freshwater by runoff flow. These include nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen from septic systems or residential fertilizers, sediments, oils, and chemicals from machinery or waterfront construction sites, pesticides used in lawn or garden care, road salts, and fecal coliform bacteria from septic systems and animal waste. As part of Watersheds Canada's Love Your Lake program, trained technicians have assessed thousands of shoreland properties on freshwater lakes. Of the properties surveyed, only 22% have maintained the recommended natural vegetative cover of 75% leaving 78% of surveyed properties susceptible to runoff-based pollutants entering the lake. Among these pollutants, nutrients and sediments are highly implicated in facilitating eutrophication, a process wherein excess phosphorus and nitrogen, whether sediment bound or dissolved, cause increased levels of algal growth, including blue-green algae or cyanobacteria. Blue-green algae blooms pose a significant threat to human health and that of wildlife through the production of toxins, the limitation of light penetration into the water, and reductions in dissolved oxygen when they decompose. The number of reported blue-green algal blooms is increasing in several parts of Canada, and this graph shows the significant increase of reported blooms in Ontario. Again, the main culprits for this increase are increased levels of anthropogenic nutrient inputs, whether from agriculture, agriculture, residential application of fertilizers, or wastewater. Another variable is rising temperatures due to climate change. With limited ice cover and uh, higher temperatures promoting algal growth, there are more intense and longer blooms. Given the significant risk that blue-green algae poses for freshwater, Landowners and policymakers need to consider solutions that are not only economically viable, but whose efficacy is also supported by scientific inquiry. Thankfully, there is an abundance of literature describing the effectiveness of vegetated shoreland buffers in limiting nutrient and sediment inputs into lakes, rivers, and streams from runoff. The mechanisms whereby shoreland vegetation mitigate runoff involve two major functions. The first being a reduction in runoff flow velocity, and the second being increased levels of soil infiltration. Now, I'm sure many who are attending this webinar have seen this infographic from Rideau Valley Conservation. It is an excellent resource and shows the relative difference between the runoff reduction potential of a well-vegetated shoreland and a disturbed one. 
Let's imagine runoff traveling down the slope of the hill in this figure. In the left-hand image, runoff must travel through a dense thicket of upland trees, riparian shrubs, and herbaceous plants, all of which act together to physically slow the runoff. On top of that, the leaf litter and other organic debris slows the runoff even further and traps water that will eventually evaporate. When slowed down, runoff is much more likely to enter the soil in a process known as soil infiltration. Once infiltration occurs, pollutants and sediments are deposited into the soil instead of reaching the water. The vegetation itself also promotes higher rates of soil infiltration by increasing soil porosity with its network of root systems. Native vegetation also promotes communities of soil burying insects and other organisms that create micropores in the soil, which promotes infiltration even further. But now let's switch gears to a real world example. When native vegetation is removed from shorelands and replaced with concrete retaining walls, riprap, or mowed lawns, it's a, it affects water quality. In this video clip, we show a property maintaining a mowed lawn to the water's edge. When rain falls on this property, pollutants are more easily carried by surface runoff into the water due to the absence of vegetation that would otherwise intercept it and promote infiltration. When we look at the littoral zone of this property, we see very few aquatic plants to hold down sediment and cyclonutrients, and there's very little aquatic habitat for littoral fish, like a foraging pumpkin seed that will come into frame here shortly. There he is. Ultimately, water quality in this situation is quite low. Now, someone who has just moved to this area in the video might not understand that their shoreland isn't natural, but it certainly does not have to be like this. When native vegetation and organic structures are maintained and the shoreland is kept as natural as possible, water quality and ecosystem function are greatly enhanced. Adjacent to this naturalized shoreland, water quality is much higher. Any runoff from upland sources is greatly reduced to a, due to a thick buffer of vegetation. And there is an abundance of littoral vegetation too, which creates wildlife habitat. Once we go back to the surface, you'll see that there are vast amount of natural structures for basking reptiles and shelter for fish. Ultimately, the difference between the two in terms of ecological and physical quality is quite striking and reflects the great importance of maintaining a vegetated shoreline buffer, shoreline buffer, excuse me. Now, a common question and concern among landowners, decision makers, and scientists alike is the size of buffer needed to improve or maintain high levels of water quality. In several scientific studies, buffers in the range of 20 to 30 meters have exhibited rates of nutrient and pollution abatement between 80% and 90%. However, it is important to note that variation in the effectiveness of different buffer widths across scientific studies is quite high. More simply, some studies show high rates of pollution abatement with smaller buffers, while other studies show a distinct relationship between larger buffers and nutrient reductions. While size does sometimes dominate the discussion behind vegetative buffers, other factors that determine a buffer's capacity to moderate runoff and associated pollutants must be considered. This includes plant community structure and composition, for example, plant types within the buffer, the density and maturity of the plants. Another variable is the slope of the land. For example, higher slopes increase runoff flow velocity, thus necessitating a wider buffer. Finally, there's the variable of soil type. Clay soils may require larger buffers due to lower soil infiltration potential compared to loam or sand soil types. In light of the complexity surrounding shoreland buffer size and composition, a golden rule should always be followed. A vegetated buffer should be as wide and biologically diverse as the property or circumstances will allow. Not being able to meet a recommended width should never preclude waterfront property owners from maintaining or planting a vegetated shoreland buffer. Ultimately, any buffer is better than no buffer at all. Considering the numerous factors that should be considered when planning and planting a vegetative buffer, it's easy to understand how such a process can be intimidating for landowners. The Natural Edge Program, its native plant database, and the planting plan template, template offered through Planning for Our Shorelands are two excellent resources, resources that can help shoreland residents get started 
and protecting the quality of their fresh water by planting a shoreland buffer. Now, another significant issue for many shoreland property owners is erosion, being the detachment or movement of soil caused by waves, rain, snowmelt, or flooding. When enough sediment on a shoreland becomes unstable and erodes into the water, there can be massive reductions in local water clarity and quality. Vegetated buffers help reduce the possibility of erosion through several different mechanisms, including the insulation of soil from the impact of rainfall, and of course, the mitigation of surface runoff. Indeed, many scientists have found that erosion has been shown to be proportional to runoff flow velocity. Native vegetation also stabilizes shoreland soils with their network of root systems, thus providing erosion protection below the surface. In this infographic, we see the tremendous difference between the root systems of native plants and shrubs compared to that of mowed grass, which we can see up here in the left-hand corner. If we imagine these root systems at a scale similar to that which we viewed in the video shown previously, we can imagine the stabilization potential of a buffer composed of many different shrub, tree, and herbaceous plant species. The planting of shoreland vegetation is considered a soft or nature-based method of erosion control and has been touted by scientists as a means of controlling erosion that unlike hard engineering solutions such as riprap or armoring, provides ecosystem value through the provision of habitat. Of course, there are many severe situations that also require hard engineering solutions. But the point is, is that these should not be thought of alone and should always be augmented with native vegetation to create habitat and to enhance the slope stabilization potential and runoff reduction potential that native vegetation provides. Of course, as the ecologist in the room, uh, it would be difficult to have a discussion about vegetated shoreland buffers, buffers without considering the critical habitat that they provide for wildlife. There is strong consensus in the scientific literature that vegetated and native shoreland habitat is among the most important for wildlife and will prove even more essential as climate change increases the incidence of extreme temperature events. It is estimated that 70% of wildlife globally rely on riparian habitat during at least one point in their life cycle, and that the littoral zone is utilized by up to 90% of aquatic lake species. The importance of shoreland ecosystems to wildlife cannot be understated, and it is for this reason that careful consideration of wildlife be taken when planting shoreland buffers. Now, much like the conversation around water quality, Buffer size recommendations to achieve habitat and wildlife related objectives vary based on the species and study under consideration. Buffer areas as wide as 100 meters have been recommended to support certain species, but for most shoreland properties, a buffer of this size would be difficult, if not possible, to achieve. This should not, however, deter landowners and decision makers from restoring or promoting buffers to the fullest extent possible to reestablish or maintain habitat function. For several species that rely on shoreland habitat, it is often less about size and more about the type and diversity of native plants that determines its effectiveness. The following figure was taken from a study conducted in 2021 that reviews 30 studies on shoreland buffers along freshwater streams. While many of the papers reviewed in this meta-analysis provide size metric recommendations, shown here in the first four bars, a majority of them do not provide uh, width recommendations and instead focus on the importance of characteristics other than size, including plant community structure, levels of human disturbance or fragmentation within the buffer, and the presence of invasive species. Each ecozone that makes up a shoreland provides unique habitat for wildlife. For example, the mature trees of uplands are preferred by several species of birds and provide important overwintering habitat for amphibians and reptiles that spend the breeding season in the riparian or the littoral zone. However, during breeding periods, bird diversity, diversity may be higher in riparian zones due to greater food resources and littoral ecosystems are obviously critical for piscivorous birds, such as my personal favorite, the belted kingfisher. Ultimately, during the planning and management and planting of vegetated shoreland buffers, the structural habitat needs of local species must be considered alongside, alongside considerations of size. 
The final topic we will discuss today is arguably the defining topic of our generation, being climate change. While the impacts of climate change on freshwater ecosystems are difficult to generalize, most freshwater systems will experience negative impacts through rising water temperatures, the increased risk of flooding, and shifts in wildlife assemblages. Perhaps not surprising, the impacts of climate change intersect with each of the issues we have discussed thus far. Higher temperatures are projected to promote longer and more intense blue-green algae outbreaks. In regions that experience more extreme rainfall events, nutrient loading and erosion will become a more severe issue. In 2017, an extreme rainfall event caused a 27-fold increase in phosphor and lo phosphorus loading in Conestoga Lake in Ontario, facilitating a premature blue-green algae bloom in the spring. In addition to impacts on water quality, aquatic and non-aquatic species will be directly impacted by climate change as extreme weather events and droughts decrease water quality and cause physiological stress for both native plants and animals. There are countless scientific studies discussing how shoreland buffers comprised of a diversity of native vegetation can tr contribute to climate change resilience for people and wildlife alike. This increased resilience occurs through many different functions including the suppression of erosion and stabilizations of shorelines that are susceptible to flooding. By mitigating nutrient loading, shoreland buffers also serve as a means of mitigating those longer and more intense algal blooms that we discussed. Finally, shoreland buffers will also become critical areas of climate refugia for species already under pressure from extreme weather events. Riparian zones alone will be essential areas of refugia and habitat for aquatic wild wildlife since they maintain, according to Dr. Nathaniel Seavey and his colleagues, a higher water content in surrounding upland areas, thus absorbing heat and buffering organisms from extreme temperatures. As we mentioned previously, the material we have discussed during this webinar and the scientific studies um, supporting them are currently available through a new resource titled, The Science Behind Vegetated Shoreland Buffers which is available for download from the Watersheds Canada website in which you will all receive a link to. We would also like to encourage anyone concerned about Ontario's proposed Bill 23 to sign our petition against said legislation. The ability of our municipalities to protect and restore shorelands across Ontario is under threat by Bill 23. Watersheds Canada has analyzed the proposed changes and has put together an email campaign against the bill. If you haven't done so already, Please help us reach our goal and tell your local MPP that you are against these proposed changes. Lastly, we want to take this opportunity to promote our Giving Tuesday campaign. Giving Tuesday is tomorrow, and this year you have the opportunity to double your impact to help protect and restore our shorelands. Maitland Tower has committed to matching all new monthly donations this Giving Tuesday. And now we will host our questions and answer period. And thank you again for uh, listening to me and we'll enjoy taking some questions. Awesome, thank you, Chris, for the awesome presentation. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, I think the first one we have is, how does waterfront development, like campgrounds, for example, affect our fresh water? And what should decision makers be considering with regards to uh, establishing shoreland buffers? Well, that's a good question. Um, in terms of campgrounds and like any other development, if the development and we don't want to necessarily take the term development and make it to seem to be that all development is necessarily bad. There, there are ways to conduct shoreline or shoreland development that maintains vegetative buffers and maintains fresh water quality. So if we return our attention to the image that I showed at the beginning of the webinar being the large multi-story home that had removed or stripped all the vegetation from the riparian and upland zone. That's the sort of development that we uh, wouldn't want because it would um, obviously promote runoff entering the water that would carry pollutants that might cause algal blooms or things like that. So how it affects um, water quality is really uh, through the maintenance of buff like how buffers uh, reduce the propensity for runoff to enter the water is through soil infiltration and reductions of flow velocity 
And um, it's the type of developments that we want to see are the ones that maintain vegetated shorelands. So we're not saying that you can't develop close to the water, but really it's the maintenance of any sort of vegetated buffer, the largest that the situation can allow, which will ultimately increase water quality by intercepting pollutants that are carried by runoff. Yeah, and I think what a lot of our conversations usually are, are framed around is, yeah, the establishment of this vegetative buffer as wide as we can, but then there's also mechanisms like um, um, building setbacks and stuff like that, right, that we kind of promote as well in, in the decision-making process. I think that's also going through zoning and stuff like that we've had mentioned in the chat so far. Um, another question we have, and I guess um, I can kind of speak to this one as well. So what are the impacts of Bill 23 for waterfront properties? And this seems to be a very big topic that we're seeing. Uh, I think Chris and I do several presentations and <laughs> the, the policy side of things is definitely, uh, definitely always comes up. So uh, I see a lot of chat. Um, going on about Bill 23. And so I guess, Chris, you can jump into this conversation too. Um, what we've seen so far about Bill 23 is that it does uh, threaten the ability of municipalities, um, municipal planners and council members in uh, regulating waterfront development, especially around site plan control uh, and their ability to dictate um, landscaping. So I guess um, if a proposal comes in, um, it really degrades the municipality's ability to um, impose vegetative requirements. I guess, Chris, we can talk about some environmental night gain stuff as a result of that kind of thing, right? Yeah, and that's what we're talking about with Bill 23 really is the ability for us to have proper review of um, developments and the maintenance of certain things that are gonna keep freshwater environments uh, safe. Like it's one of those, um, you know, expediating growth of uh, developments in the province, which, um, you know, white wall understandable where we need to build more homes, that's an obvious issue. The manner in which it occurs is obviously extremely important. And what the bill does is it limits the ability of our conservation authorities and municipalities to really produce the sort of development that we wanna see that maintains vegetative shorelands and protects freshwater quality and the wildlife that are there. And those are major concerns with the bill and the concerns that are shared quite widely across the province. Uh, we have some, oh, we have a good question here. Um, so Chris, why did you single out that invasive plants are necessarily worse at absorbing harmful runoff? Is there any science to support this? Well, there is science that supports that certain invasive species are uh, not as uh, good at absorbing or reducing runoff. But uh, another thing is that when you have invasive species in aquatic environments, such as shorelands, what it does is it impedes the ability of um, species of wildlife that rely on those littoral or riparian habitats, like they have um, less nutrient quality, um, they disrupt the growth of native plants, they're less dense. So yes, there is science supporting that. Um, can't speak to that specifically right now in terms of a study, but what I do know is that there's an abundance of literature that shows that wildlife ultimately um, suffer as a result of invasive species crowding out native species. So anytime you have an invasive, um, when it becomes established, it's extremely difficult to remove. So promoting um, for whatever reason it is for promoting wildlife well-being or um, increasing the community complexity in a riparian zone or another shoreland zone, um, ma making sure that those invasives don't make their way into the shoreland habitat because once they're established, it becomes extremely difficult to remove them. And the complexity of the ecosystem is ultimately reduced and that will have an impact on how much runoff is uh, intercepted as well as the well-being of wildlife. So yes, there is a pretty healthy scientific consensus that um, preventing invasives from, from becoming established on shoreland ecosystems is extremely important. So uh, we have a lot of, uh, our most of our um, network is predominantly in uh, Eastern Ontario. And so we usually have a lot of conversations with landowners about how to plant on the Canadian Shield, especially. Um, there are people who, there are properties that have some difficulties in establishing 
um, a buffer as, as a consequence of that. So do you have any special recommendations for dealing with uh, rocky shorelands? Well, the best thing you can do really is, um, for one thing, is use some of the free resources that Watersheds Canada has provided, you know, shameless plug here in terms of um, the uh, native plant database. So there are filters that these resources provide that um, will give you plant recommendations based on soil type and topographic uh, variables. So that can give you a, a good idea as to what plants you should choose and plan to plant. Um, yeah, I can't necessarily speak too much to the um, planting side of things, uh, species specific, but there are certainly resources, the pl uh, planting plan template that we've just developed and the native uh, plant database through the Natural Edge program. There are experts that are able to go through, admittedly, a very complicated process of not only planting the plants in the shoreland, but also making sure that they're maintained and they uh, grow to maturity, which is obviously an issue with a lot of people. So um, yeah, I would defer to the experts on that, but the natural edge is a great place to start to get advice on how to not only plant and pick what species are appropriate for your shoreland, but also how to ensure that they'll make it to maturity and uh, make sure that they are uh, affecting water quality to the highest extent, because oftentimes it's the mature plants that are doing most of the work, right? Exactly. Yeah. And our natural edge team has a lot of knowledge and helps deliver um, these plants to properties and actually walks property owners through how to uh, how to get the best results from um, plantings. Another question here, Chris, is um, something that I know you've looked into quite a bit. So I'm looking forward to hearing your response to this. Um, so at the lake scale, uh, has there been any studies linking property value to a percentage of intact shoreline? Uh, yeah, lots of studies, actually. And when I first started digging into this, I was uh, really happy to see there's a pretty healthy literature on the relationship between property values and water quality, um, one that Darlene and I have uh, spoken to and one which I reference in the uh, um, Science Behind Shoreland Buffers document is they used a hedonistic analysis, which is basically um, comparing something that's you know, non-financial, the value of something non-financial and putting it to giving it a financial value based on the based on the uh, people who are valuing the property. That's a very bad way of explaining. I'm sure the people who work on these things are, I just butchered that. But the idea is, is that for every increase in a, a measure of water quality or water clarity, one example is uh, sucky disk or sushi disk depth. So they found that for every foot of additional water quality, they found that there was a significant increase in the property value or valuation of the property on the shoreland. So there's that study. There are also studies that show the presence of invasive, uh, certain invasive species. Eurasian milfoil being one obvious example has a pretty significant or uh, statistically significant impact on the value that a buyer would put on a shoreland property. So I make reference to that, uh, the second disk depth paper in the shoreland buffer document, but there's a really healthy literature out there that shows that it's not only about, you know, the ecosystem services, but, you know, the brass tats, the tangible financial valuation that we put on shoreland properties is also impacted by the maintenance of vegetative buffers. So I'm just going through the chat, sorry. So um, we have a question here about um, grant subsidies. So a grant subsidies available to local government or property owners um, to assist in restoring their shorelands. And I think uh, we partner quite a bit with municipalities and other local organizations, but Chris, can you talk to any um, subsidies or that you're aware of that um, can help with this issue? Not off the top of my head, but again, defer to the Natural Edge program and giving advice to um, organizations from across Canada. It's not just limited to, like Darlene said, in our own neck of the woods, right? We've helped uh, organizations as far as Saskatchewan and uh, Manitoba, and we have really great connections there. So um, in terms of grant and subsidies, again, off the top of my head, apologies, I can't think of anything right now, but uh, what I will say is that when you do find organizations such as Watersheds Canada and the Natural Edge Program, 
it's significantly cheaper to um, plant these vegetated shorelands than it is to explore other, you know, kind of knee jerk reaction options like the hard engineering solutions. So we've uh, crunched the numbers and through the natural edge program, uh, property owners and organizations would ultimately be saving a lot of money by planting vegetated buffers and having the resources that they need not only to plant the buffers, but to also see that the buffer reaches maturity, right? So um, there are options there. And yeah, apologies again, I can't speak to any subsidies off the top of my head. Yeah, I think there are a bunch of um, foundations and stuff like that that do provide those. So um, I would just encourage to check some of those out. I know TD has some as well, uh, but Natural Edge does offer some subsidized rates for renaturalizing. So um, we do offer quite a bit of help, not only just in setting things up, but also the financial side as well. Uh, I know some conservation authorities might do it as well. So if we don't necessarily deliver for your area immediately, I would definitely encourage maybe a conservation authority, for example, as well. Um, and just to reiterate that all the documents that were put in the chat and those mentioned um, in this presentation today um, are for free download on our website. So I'm going to be sending a follow up email after this presentation to um, with all those links provided. And so um, I think that's pretty much all. Oh, one more question for you, Chris. Yeah, sure. Uh, so do you know any mechanisms to prevent wake injury to shorelines? Uh, well, vegetative buffers. Um, so uh, wake impacts are a big issue for a lot of areas. So when we're talking about erosion too, when we're talking about anything that that in, imposes a, a force or energy, like we're really getting the brass tacks of physics here. But uh, if you have something barren and you know people are zipping by on their sea dews or boats or whatever, um, really on top of having signage and um, you know uh, promoting boat wake uh, limitations during certain times, I know a lot of lake and river associations are on top of that already, trying to limit wakes. Um, having your shoreland buffer. So the denser and more diverse that your shoreland buffer is, the more energy that it's going to be able to absorb when those wakes occur. Sometimes there are situations where there's you know a pretty steep edge that can make that a little bit difficult. But that would be my first and foremost uh, suggestion. And to take it as a shoreland and not just consider a shoreland buffer or a shoreline buffer, but also consider the littoral zone and the aquatic plants that you can promote in those sorts of environments, because ultimately the wake has to travel through the littoral before it reaches the shoreland. So you're reducing the energy that that wake has when you have a buffer of vegetation in the littoral before it even reaches the shoreline, right? So again, use that ecosystem-based management approach to think about all the opportunities that aquatic and terrestrial vegetation can provide in reducing the wake energy that boats produce. Thanks for the, that answer, Chris. And so I think we are winding down. So I just want to do a little bit of um, some administrative stuff here. Thank you, everyone, for for joining our presentation today. Um, <clears throat> we will be sending out, as mentioned before, a follow up email with all the links and resources that were mentioned today. And I really like what I was going through the chat, Julia Kirkwood's comment. So I want to actually steal that and put that into our conclusion. So she was saying that in Michigan, not everyone can do everything, but everyone can do something. And so I think that kind of relates back to like my favorite Dr. Seuss story, uh, the Lorax. Um, and so when we're thinking about these shoreland buffers, it is something that maybe not everyone can get the perfect buffer size or the perfect um, density or anything like that, but just having one in general, as Chris was saying, is something that we want to try to see, promote and not only in individual decision-making, but also on a wider scale in municipal provincial decision-making as well. So thank you very much for joining today's presentation. If you have any questions following today, you can always send me an email at shorelandproject at watersheds.ca and Chris and I can address it for you. But thank you very much for joining us and I hope to see you guys at the next webinar.